Here's your outline for Matthew chapter 16. Verse 1 through 4, the Pharisees show up and they demand signs. Verse 5 through 12, the false doctrine of the apostates. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were apostates. Verse 13 through 20 is Peter's confession. He confesses that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 21 through 23, Jesus prophesies his death, burial, and resurrection. Then verse 24 through 28, Jesus tells them to take up their cross and follow him. We all are aware of Jesus' teachings about the world to come. However, there's still a need for all of us to understand them properly with the explanation given by an expert like Robert Breaker. What does Matthew 16, 1 through 28 tell us? And what sort of lesson can we get from it if we delve deep into its explanation? That's exactly what we are going to find out in this video today. So without any further delay, let's get started. And there's two groups here. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I don't know how much I'll, I'll talk about them. They were the ruling class, okay? There was a thing in Israel called the Sanhedrin, and there were 70 of them. It's kind of like our Congress. And they were consisting of Sadducees and Pharisees. So that's your Democrats, Republicans, if you will, in those days. And they were basically the same. They, they all believed in one God. They believed the law was given by that God to Israel. They believed that, except for the Sadducees. They did not believe in the afterlife. They denied the resurrection of the dead. Robert initiates the chapter by talking about two groups, which are called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 16. According to Breaker, these were actually known as the ruling class of Israel, which was based on 70 people. These two groups almost believed in everything as we as believers do today, except for the Sadducees, as they didn't believe in the afterlife, and according to them, there was no such concept of getting alive again and hence, there was no afterlife as per their concept. Talking about such people, Robert shows an expression of surprise as there are such people in this world as well who think just like the Sadducees. For a person to have their faith completed, it is mandatory to believe on a day on which every human can stand accountable for their actions and deeds, and if someone believes that there is no such day that is going to come, then there is no point to have a religion or a particular belief. Because then, you will just die in the end and will not be accountable for your bad deeds in front of God. So for a person to have their faith completed, they must believe in a day when every human will be asked about what they did in the world, whether it was good or bad, and how they did it, and that's what Breaker is pointing out here. The Pharisees, as Robert talks about them, were mostly priests. Apart from these two groups, there was another group of people as well in that time. And they were called the Essenes, who were very much into the law, according to Breaker. All of these three groups were against Jesus and didn't like him much. They came to Jesus to seek a sign so that they could believe in him. According to Breaker, this is simple about believing or not believing. There is nothing else to it. There is no need to see any miracles in front of your eyes if you believe. Believing comes from the heart, not the eyes. Faith comes from the heart, not the eyes. The Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted to put Jesus to the test, to show that he is nothing, that they are the only ones who can discern the times, and that only they can grasp what God is doing. Talking about the signs a little further in verse 2 to 3, Robert explains that humans are always guessing. They always utilize their human interpretation as if it were God's doing. For instance, we understand the meaning of a red sky, but who created the red sky? We speculate on why the sky is red, but we forget that the Lord is the one who made it so. We fail to consider who created everything. First, appreciate the Creator's hand in everything. In verse 4, Breaker talks about the evil and adulterous generation, which are the right terms to be used here for them. Even when they have witnessed the Lord Jesus' previous miracles, they still seek a sign. 
The Pharisees and Sadducees were perplexed by the Lord's presence among mankind and requested a sign from the heaven. They are clouded and blind. Another generation has not witnessed the miracles, yet believes. Thus this age has committed the greater sin. Even for us, we read of the Lord's miracles, which we haven't seen, but the word has spoken to us, and we believe. And that's what Breaker is talking about here. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. <laughs> Why are they forgetting? Well, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So maybe they're just like, well, he is the bread. And maybe they're thinking, well, he's always taken care of us before. But he gave them one job and they can't even do that right. All right. So if they're a type of a preacher, what's a preacher supposed to have? The bread. This is the spiritual food. So when a guy gets on the pulpit, he should teach you something. Uh, some pulpits you go to, instead of bread, they just give you a little bit of flour and you choke on it. You know, it's, they never, it's hard to go to church and just sit there and listen and just get a, a milk sop message. Um, I have a friend who's blind and he's an evangelist and we've talked before about how bad churches have gotten. Do you know you can learn more reading the Bible than going to churches nowadays? Now I'm not saying don't go to church. Find a good church where they actually teach the Bible. But uh, we were talking about how we have to feed ourselves. I hope you read your Bible the rest of the week because you need to feed yourself. It's like bread. Boy, I got off on that, didn't I? So, and when the disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now Jesus is talking about bread and he mentions a word, leaven. What is leaven? Well, leaven is like yeast. What do you use to make bread? Yeast. Now there's kind of two different kinds of bread. In the Old Testament, God said unleavened bread. He told them not to put yeast, but to make bread without yeast. So false doctrine, it might look like you're growing, but it will fall very quick. So if you go out and you start a church on false doctrine, is that church growing in the Lord or is that church swelling and is about to fall? Here, Robert talks about how Jesus turned a physical problem of the Pharisees and Sadducees into a spiritual lesson by warning them about the false doctrine, comparing it to leaven, which can contaminate the entire batch of bread. Over here, Robert emphasizes the necessity of avoiding incorrect ideology and false doctrine, as even a small amount can have a large impact. In these verses, Robert is telling that the words of the disciples had no hidden meaning. The disciples did not dwell on Jesus' remarks. Instead, they were preoccupied with the fact that they had forgotten to bring bread. The disciples were ordinary people with ordinary minds and noble hearts. According to him, the Lord teaches us to be aware of traditions. As time passes, their traditional lifestyle teachings no longer correspond to the teachings of the past, meaning they no longer correspond to the teachings received by the prophets from the Lord. As per Breaker's opinion, one should not mix human teachings with the teachings of the word of life. If you mix old and new teachings, the first leaf that emerges in your faith will be curled rather than unfolded, and your understanding will not deepen. What figure does our Lord use to describe the false doctrines that he warns his disciples about? He refers to them as yeast. They may appear insignificant in comparison to the entire body of truth, much like yeast. They, like yeast, would work quietly and quietly once accepted. They would, like yeast, gradually transform the entire character of the religion with which they were combined. How much information can be packed into a single word? Not only was there the open risk of heresy, but also yeast, which the apostles were warned about. According to Breaker, there is much in all of this that calls loudly for the close attention of all professing Christians. The caution of our Lord in this passage has been shamefully neglected. It would have been well for the Church of Christ if the warnings of the Gospel had been as much studied as its promises. Our Lord's remark regarding the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was intended for all time. It was not intended just for the generation to which it was addressed. It was intended to help the Church of Christ in perpetuity. He who spoke it viewed the future history of Christianity with a prophetic eye. The big physician was well aware that Pharisee and Sadducee beliefs would be the two big wasting diseases of his church till the end of time. He would have us believe that there will always be Pharisees and Sadducees among Christians. Their succession is unbreakable. Their generation will never die off. Their name may change, but their essence will not. As a result, he warns us to take heed and beware, and that is what Breaker is trying to tell us here. 
When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So Jesus asked them, Who am I? Now remember, I don't know if you remember, but we've talked about the difference between the who and the what. In Jesus' earthly ministry, it was all about who he is. And they had to believe he was the Messiah. When the Jews rejected their Messiah, Jesus told Paul, here's what I want you to do. Go tell them more about what I did. Tell them about justification and how you can be justified through the blood. Jesus says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the people of Israel are, are sitting around talking, saying, we've seen signs from this guy. We've seen miracles. Uh, who do you think he is? And one guy goes, well, I think it's John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and Simon Peter, now Simon Peter has three names, Simon, Peter, and Cephas. This is going to be important here in a minute. Cephas is also his name. And Simon Peter answered and said, now this is so important, we call this Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Talking about all the other prophets, Breaker pinpoints Peter and what he said about Jesus Christ. Peter declares Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus recognizes Peter's assertion, implying that the church would be formed on the premise that Jesus is the Christ. According to Breaker, the Lord poses two questions to his disciples. The Lord poses these questions to help the disciples consider who Jesus is in their hearts. Until this time, his disciples had never considered who they were calling Lord and Teacher, or what he truly meant to them. The Lord wants to ask the same question of us Christians. Who is Jesus for us? This question is a test of faith for everyone who believes and follows today, not just the disciples of the time. Putting light on Jesus as being the only true Christ, Breaker further talks about Peter's confession, which is of great importance here. According to Breaker, the truth has been disclosed to Peter as a result of his heart. The underlying meaning of Peter's pledge appears to be that he would have the unusual distinction of being the first to open the door of salvation to both Jews and Gentiles. This was accomplished in the letter when he preached to the Jews on Pentecost and visited Gentile Cornelius at his home. On each occasion, he utilized the keys opening the door of faith. The church that Jesus predicts would be built on a rock is the blessed company of all believing people. It is not the visible church of any one nation, country, or location. It is the entire body of believers, all ages, tongues, and peoples. It is a church made up of all who have been washed in Christ's blood, clothed in Christ's righteousness, renewed by Christ's spirit, connected to Christ by faith, and living epistles of Christ. It is a really holy church in which every member is baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is a church with a unified body. According to Breaker, these verses of the chapter indicate that the might of Satan will never be able to destroy the people of Christ. He who introduced sin and death into the first world by enticing Eve will never destroy the new creation by toppling believers. Christ's mythical body will never die or fade. It will never cease, despite being persecuted, afflicted, distressed, and brought down. It will outlast Pharaoh's and Roman emperor's wrath. Visible churches, like Ephesus, may fail. However, the true church never dies. And that's what Breaker is saying in this clip. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. There's the gospel, death, burial, resurrection. But verse 22 says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. <laughs> the first pope! corrects Jesus. And you want me to follow him? Uh, no. What did Jesus say? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Jesus rebukes Peter and says, Man, what, you got Satan in you or something? You're telling me prophecy that I give is not going to be fulfilled? Really? Is that what you're telling? He said, You're offending me right now. So what should we follow? Peter or Jesus? Jesus? Jesus. Look how expensive. Have you ever been inside a Catholic church? Many of the Catholic churches have all these statues. I call them idols. idols. And the Bible says not. And they're all plated in gold. You go to the Pope. You know, most of his clothes have threads of gold in it. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. <laughs> the Pope says, I'm the richest man on earth. There's kind of a... Have you ever been to the Vatican? 
Some of the doors have gold on it. They're, what is this? It's not the religion of Jesus Christ. Breaker talks about how Jesus predicts his own death, burial, and resurrection. In skepticism, Peter rebukes Jesus, triggering a powerful reaction from Jesus that emphasizes the divine plan. Breaker also puts light on how our Lord reveals a major and stunning truth to his disciples at the commencement of these passages, that reality was his impending death on the cross. For the first time, he brings to their attention the astonishing news that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed. According to him, the majority of Jews had no concept of a suffering Messiah. They were unaware that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah had to be literally fulfilled. They didn't realize that the law's sacrifices were all meant to point them to the death of the actual Lamb of God. They were just thinking of the second glorious coming of Messiah, which is yet to occur at the end of the world. They were so focused on the Messiah's crown that they missed his cross. This is something we should keep in mind. A correct comprehension of this topic shed significant light on the lessons included in this section that Breaker tried to highlight in the best possible way. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And what does it mean to take up your cross and follow him? The last part of this discussion orbits a very important thing of our lives as believers, and that is to have our faith in Jesus and follow him in each and every aspect of our lives. And that's what Breaker has tried to tell us here. Jesus instructs his followers to take up their cross and follow him. This signifies the commitment and sacrifice required in discipleship. The teaching emphasizes the spiritual aspect and, doctrinally, relates to the context of Jesus' earthly ministry to Jews. To understand the relationship between these texts, we must recall our Lord's disciples' erroneous assumptions about the purpose of his entrance into this world. They, like Peter, could not stand the thought of the crucifixion. They believed Jesus had come to establish an earthly kingdom. They failed to recognize that he would have to suffer and die. They fantasized about worldly honors and temporal benefits in the service of their master. They failed to recognize that authentic Christians, like Christ, must be perfected through suffering. Our Lord corrects these misunderstandings with words of unusual solemnity, which we should treasure in our hearts. Our Lord dispels his pupils' cherished fantasies by teaching them that his followers must take up the cross. The glorious kingdom they had hoped for will not be established right now. If they wanted to be his slaves, they had to be willing to face persecution and tribulation. They must be willing to lose their lives if their souls are to be saved. According to Breaker, these verses discuss faith from two perspectives, earthly and heavenly. It reminds us that it is not about this life to be lost, but about the everlasting life to come. If you seek fulfillment in this life, you will lose your life in Jesus' world. This world is nothing. If you close your heart around the things of this world and become eager for the things of this world, your link to the next world becomes thinner. The Bible provides a guide for both this world and the world to come. It also teaches us to always return to the Bible to fulfill our life in this world. Utilize the Bible as a guide and we will ultimately save ourselves. Take only what is essential on this earth because nothing on this planet lasts. It is important for all of us to understand this concept. We must not deny that true Christianity entails a daily cross in this life while promising us a crown of splendor in the life to come. The flesh must be crucified on a daily basis. The devil must be opposed on a daily basis. Every day, the globe must be conquered. There is combat to be fought and warfare to be waged. All of this is an unavoidable companion of authentic faith. Heaven cannot be obtained without it. The old adage, no cross, no crown, has never been more true. Our spirits are in bad shape if we never discover this via experience. When taken together with the preceding verses, this remark of our Lord has profound wisdom. He understands a man's heart. He knows how quickly we will be thrown down and, like Israel of old, discouraged by the difficulties of the way. As a result, Christ extends to us a kind promise. He reminds us that he is yet to return, as certainly as he did the first time. He says that now is the time for his disciples to receive their wonderful gifts. 
all who have served and loved Jesus.